So we're going to talk about something called big data. So my question is that, uh, is there anyone who is already working uh, in the big data domain? Then my job is easy in that, in that way. So any of you are already familiar with the big data and working in the domain? Is there anyone? Okay. So we have a big data team who ingest the data and probably work on the big data, what they are creating. Oh, okay. But, but what do you do? I mean, uh, so basically, I work on files part. So we create more of descriptive analytics and into analytics team right now. Uh -huh. So we code and pull the data from the, from the packet files or whatever they are creating and mm -hmm. ingest in mm -hmm. into the lake. Mm -hmm. So I have the but not much idea, but yeah. yeah, but if you say that you're working on PySpark, then that technically means you are already working on big data, right? I mean, if I have to say. Because the base anyway, that means we have a big data team who is creating data and ingesting it to the link. Okay. okay. Uh, who else? Who else is bold enough to say that I'm coming from the field? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any questions or anything. <laughs> like, give me the definition or something. Nobody is there from big data domain. Okay, probably not. I mean, I don't blame you. Um, maybe you are already coming, uh, or or you are already part of something related to big data, but maybe you are not completely convinced that you are working on big data, right? Okay, so this term is actually a very elusive, or uh, how do I say? It is a very relative term. So uh, big data, this term was very popular. I would say around eight years back or 10 years back. Even today it is very popular, but the meaning has changed a lot. Okay, so uh, when I started working in big data, it was when somebody said big data, it was like, oh, that's something really great stuff that you're working on. But today when you say that you are in the big data domain, that's like, oh, chalo, that's so, it will happen anyway. <laughs> so something like that. So uh, before we understand what is big data or what is industry aspect of big data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you need to have a slight idea about what is the world without big data, right? So before I talk about big data, I have to tell you what is the world looks like without big data. So traditionally, if let's say you're working for a company, uh, I don't know, ABC Corporation, any company, right? And let's say this company is having a lot of products, right? So let's say uh, I was with this uh, uh, company called... Uh, insurance company, AXA, right? That is a AXA, right? So I was working with them as a consultant for some time. So they are into life insurance business, right? So take an example of AXA, just as an example, okay? So this company, what they do, um, so they have a product called life insurance, which they sell to all the US customers. In US, insurance is big deal, not like in India. In, Indi in India, even if you hit and die, nobody cares about <laughs> insurance, but in US it is million dollar business, right? So AXA has a lot of customers in India as well as in US. So in US, what they have done, they have a platform where people visit and buy insurance. So you have a portal where you can log in and say that I want to buy an insurance for my bike or myself or anything like that, right? So basically they have a website kind of thing, okay? From there, people actually buy insurance, right? So if you're buying an insurance online or if you go to them and physically purchase an insurance copy, these transactions that are happening in the website are actually handled by an RDBMS system. So I'm assuming that you at least know what is a database and all, right? So I don't, I don't have to tell you what it is, right? Okay. So AXA uh, was actually using Oracle to handle all the you know insurance transactions. So if you pay some money to their insurance or renew your insurance, anything that you do, this website will take care of it. And all the data that website has is being dumped into Oracle. So Oracle is their database, point number one. AXA also has a customer portal. They call it as their CRM. It's called the Customer Relationship Management System. Wherein they keep details like uh, the customer's name, age, and ethnicity, you know, all these customer related information. So the CRM also dumps the data, but CRM is using MySQL for some reason, another IDBMS. 
So CRM is using MySQL, right? And then they have an uh, internal uh, system, which is used by this HR and other folks. They have an internal uh, uh, application, software application, where employee data and HR data and all this is getting managed, their office data. And this is using some other RDBMS. So let's say this is using, I don't know, PostgreSQL, just as an example. So you see the problem, right? I and mean, this is not a new problem, but in the traditional world, one of the problems that we have is that if you look at any organization, they will have multiple applications, not one application. And each application will be probably using a different database, right? So this guy is using Oracle, where this guy is using PostgreSQL, right? And now what happens if you are the CEO of AXA or some big shot in AXA, you want to pull a report, right? So you are basically interested in understanding uh, how many customers between 30 to 50 age group have bought an insurance from this country, etc., etc. So to pull that report, you actually need the data from all these guys because your uh, transaction data is in Oracle where the customer data is in MySQL and some other data is here. So if somebody need to do some sort of analytics or want to get a report combining all this data, the only way is that I need to get all the data from these three guys, which normally is not possible. Why it is not possible? Because usually these databases are very busy. They are serving their customers, right? So this database is very busy. This is busy. This is busy. You can't touch them. That is where in the traditional world, we do something called ETL. There is something called ETL. Maybe some of you have heard about it, okay? It stands for uh, extract, transform, and load. So basically, ETL is a tool. You connect this with all these sources, and you say that, hey, pull the data, right? So every day at, uh, let's say, midnight, 12 o'clock, an ETL job will run. And at midnight, 12 o'clock, all the data from these guys will be pulled towards, let's say, a data warehouse. So here you're going to have a data warehouse. This is called your data warehouse. So basically, the data warehouse is a place where all this data is getting dumped, right? So that you can look at the data and analyze the data. Very simple, right? Now, um, and this is something which has been happening in the industry for like past 30 years. It's not something I invented, <laughs> okay? This is something that is already there in the industry. And people were using this for quite some time. Now, once you have all your data here in your data warehouse, the beauty is that this data warehouse is internal to the company. That means the external customers are having no access here. And I can connect my business intelligence tools, things like Tableau. I think you're learning Tableau in your course. So I can, you completed, right? So you can just connect your Tableau to your data warehouse and then create visualizations, right? You complete your Tableau. So you very well know this, I mean, this exact picture, right? I don't have to tell you, by the way, right? So Tableau is one of the tools which you can use to you know, visualize your data, right? And so this is how the industry has been working for quite some time. And this is perfectly fine, no troubles. But the real problem is, so this was a nice diagram in 2002 or 2004, I don't mind. But when I go to 2010 or 2015, if I fast forward, my problems are bigger. So one of my problem is that I don't just have data in my database, I have data everywhere, right? For example, uh, when was the last time you actually went to a mobile shop and purchased a mobile phone? I don't remember. I order it online, right? And practically, you're all Bangaloreans, I believe, at least. So you order everything starting from groceries to rockets online, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm not from Bangalore, so we still go to show, but you guys order everything <laughs> online, right? So what does that signify? If you can order everything online, that means all the businesses are online and all the customers are also online. Everything is online these days, right? That means, that also means that um, I was also working with the Flipkart for quite some time. Flipkart was one of my customers, right? So I had the chance to uh, uh, work with them for a variety of their use cases. So if you look at a company like Flipkart, their major revenue is actually from the website. 
I mean, or the app, however you purchase stuff from Flipkart. So what they do, the moment, let's say you open Flipkart's website, either on your laptop or the app, they start tracking you. From which IP address are you browsing? Which city are you browsing? Uh, how much time you're spending on a product page? Which items you are zooming? Which items you are adding to cart? All this activity you do is being captured. So this is captured in multiple ways. One, they collect all the log files. So whenever you browse the website and leave, you create log entries. Second thing, there is something called clickstream data. The moment you click, that's called clickstream. Like it will generate a report, which icon you clicked and what was the effect, et cetera, et cetera. So clickstream data, then log data they capture for every customer. Okay. Now I don't really have a way to dump any of that here. Clickstream data and log data are not really something which I can fit in a table, RDBMS table. It's not raw column format. I don't know what to do with that data. Question number one. So my traditional architecture may not really work in case of Flipkart. Point number one. And every day they have millions of log entries practically. Millions of log entries. So that data is coming in and they don't know what to do. And from the app, they also collect the data. Like how much time you are using the app and a lot of statistics about the app, the way you use your app, right? So that data they collect in a format of uh, XML. The data comes in XML format, not in the normal row column format. So that data also I cannot put it anywhere here, to put it very simply. Then Flipkart also collect a lot of social media activity, right? Around uh, the city, around India as such. Like, so it is Diwali, right? Or it was Diwali, Diwali is over, right? So during the Diwali season, they conduct this, what you say, sale uh, festival, what you call big billion days and <laughs> So basically a way to empty your pockets, right? So to put it in a nutshell, but uh, they call it as uh, huge discounts and profit for them, right? So, so, but how do these sales things happen? So when big billion days were there for the first time, I was, at that time I was working for Flipkart for some time. So what they do is, first they will um, analyze the market. So they will look at the trends and also what people post in uh, social media and all to understand what is the interest. So they will generate something called interest token. So that means what you guys are really interested. How do they generate it? They will send you mailers and websites. So let's say there is a new phone getting launched. Uh, Apple iPhone, what is that? X something XR, okay, the next iPhone, right? So they will collect social media data from Twitter and Facebook whether this particular model is trending, how many people are really following this model, how many people really like this model, etc, etc. So first they capture all this data, right? And then they decide on the actual day of the sale, what, sh what they should sell, on how much uh, amount they should, sh they should sell, etc, etc. So if you are looking for something like big billion days, the amount of data they capture is in terabytes actually. So that comes in the format of uh, images, if you collect from, let's say, public feeds in Facebook and all, and news articles, comments, and tweets. The Twitter data, right, the tweets, that you can get in JSON format. There is a format called yes. JSON. Twitter data, you can typically get in JSON format. This is key value pair, again, right? And uh, then uh, from Facebook, if you are practically downloading the data, it comes in a typical format called graph, graph format. Okay. Facebook uses something called a graph API to represent the data. So it pretty much is like a graph, the data comes in. And then the text data, like what people commented, uh, what people wrote, what news article they read, etc, etc. So if they are getting all this data, first of all, they cannot feed it in this such a structure. Even if they are able to feed it, if you dump it in a data warehouse, you have no ways to analyze this kind of a data. 